A very well-known and well-respected investor in the United States, Jeremy Grantham, has said that there's not just a bubble in the United States, but there's actually a super bubble. So in this video, we'll look at what he means by that and the evidence that backs up his argument, but also what it could mean for your portfolio. So let's look at the super bubble in a bit more detail. Let's start off by looking at who Jeremy Grantham is. Here he is in an interview on Bloomberg, making many of the same points which we'll be discussing in this video. He's chief investment strategist of a company called Grantham, Mayo and Van Otterloo, usually known by its initials GMO. He was also a co-founder of Battery March Financial Management. That's actually a company which was instrumental in creating index funds. He's also a big philanthropist. He has the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy. And this isn't his first bubble. He previously called two massive bubbles the first one was the internet bubble in 2000, 2001, and another one was the housing bubble in the United States in 2006 and 2007. So when Jeremy Grantham says there's a bubble, it's always a good idea to listen to what he says. Now let's look at what he means by super bubble. One of the things that characterizes the US markets right now is that there isn't just one bubble, according to Grantham, there are actually three and a half. The first one is the obvious one, which is the equity market. The second one is the bond market, which also has high valuations. And the third one is the US housing market. And then the half bubble is in commodities. Now, a bubble is characterized when valuations go way above their norm. So if the norm is measured by the mean, the average, then we also have to know how far above average we are right now. So one of the things Grantham uses for that is called standard deviation. Don't be scared by the name. It's just the average difference from the average. So if we're multiples of that average difference from the average, you know that we're at an extreme level. So that average difference is called sigma. And if we're multiples of sigma away from the mean, then we're in a massive bubble. So this is Robert Schiller's cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio going back to 1871. And what this measures is how much people are willing to pay in dollars for every dollar of profit generated by the S&P over the previous decade. So it is a backward looking measure of valuation. And historically, it's been pretty good at picking up bubbles. Now, what I've marked here in blue is the average or the mean of Robert Schiller's measure, which is 17.3. But notice that there are long periods when the cape goes above or below that average. And if we measure the average difference from the average, that's around 7.1 times as a multiple. So if we're one standard deviation above that average, that would take us to 24.4. If we're two standard deviations above, it would take us to around 32. And three standard deviations would be just under 40. So you can see there are three periods in the past when CAPE spiked. The first one was in 1929. That was just before the huge stock market crash. And in fact, that was a three sigma event, but not using today's standard deviation. If we measured standard deviation up to that point in time, it was definitely a three sigma event, as Grantham calls it. Then the next three sigma event was the dot com bubble, which you can see here. That was also correctly called by Grantham at the time. And then recently, CAPE has crossed the three sigma threshold again, and that's the 2021 2022 bubble. So when Grantham talks about a three sigma event, it simply means that we're at a very long way from the average valuation that we've seen historically, and calling it three sigma just shows that it's a statistical extreme compared to history. So we saw that there are three sigma events historically in the US. The first one was 1929, the second was in 2000, and then we've got today. But he also points to a fourth example from another market, which was Japan in the 1980s. And we'll see more of that example later on. Another way of thinking about trends is to look at the trend growth in the S&P since, say, 1990, which is what you can see in this graph below me. The actual S&P is shown in blue, and then the dashed red line is the average growth since then, assuming an 8.2% growth rate. Now, there are long periods when you deviate above that trend, and then you get long periods below that trend. But what's noticeable is that we always go back to that trend. And after a big deviation above it, the fall is usually more severe, as we saw in 2008. So that's what worries Grantham about the current valuation, which is that we've deviated well above the trend for several of these valuation measures. And that in turn suggests that the correction, when it comes, 
will be more severe. So according to Grantham's calculations, recently we were three standard deviations above trend, which would have been an S&P, which was at around 4,500. In fact, at the end of 2021, we were well above three standard deviations above his trend. So if we revert to just two standard deviations above trend, that would mean a 27% fall relative to the end of 2021. And if we return to trend, which he says is 2,500 for the S&P, that would mean a 50% fall relative to the end of 2021. And we're still nowhere near a fall of that magnitude, even though the S&P has been wobbling recently. So this is what's got everybody's attention. It's the scale of the fall to get back to Grantham's definition of fair value. Now, to reach these very high levels of valuation takes a lot of euphoria or craziness, as Grantham calls it. And he uses the examples of meme stocks. These were stocks which were very popular with some retail investors, such as GameStop and AMC, which you can see in this graph beside me. So AMC is in blue and GME is in red, and they've been scaled such that their value was 100 at the beginning of this period, which was at the beginning of 2021. He says that this meme stock style of investing is something no one has ever seen before, happily, and hopefully we'll never see it again. And what he says makes it crazy is that companies which were worth very little increased in value hugely over a very short period of time. So GameStop was up over 100 times in a month, and AMC similarly went up hugely 40 or 50 times over a very short period. And he says these are levels of craziness that we'd not seen even in 1929, when there was that huge rally just before the crash, or even in 2000 with companies like Pet.com. He says that this time around, there's more money involved, bigger moves involved than there were in those huge bubbles of the past. So he thinks a big driver of this super bubble is craziness. The second bubble he describes is the housing market in the United States. And he uses the analogy of Japan in the late 1980s as an example of what not to do. So he says, whatever you do, don't have gloriously overpriced housing markets at the same time that you have a stock market bubble. So here you can see the Japanese stock market, the Nikkei 225, since 1955. And at the same time, you can see the average residential property prices in Japan. And that's the blue line. Notice how both of them peaked in 1990. The other thing to notice is that they still haven't recovered. These are both markets which are in drawdown. So if you do get two of these bubbles popping at the same time, the recovery period can be very long, as it was in Japan. So this is a 30-year period, and those two markets simply haven't recovered. In fact, I made a whole video about the Japanese equity and property bubble. If you look at the total value of land in Japan in 1991, it was worth about $20 trillion. That was at the same time that the entire US property market was worth about a fifth of that, just $4 trillion. And to put that into context, global wealth at the time was only $100 trillion, and equity markets were only worth $10 trillion. So the Japanese property market made up a huge proportion of global wealth. In fact, the emperor's palace in Tokyo at the time was worth as much as all of the real estate in California. Now, if we look at the average price of homes in the United States, this is the case Schiller index in blue in the top panel. You can see that recently it's been rising very sharply. And in fact, if we look at the year-on-year -year growth in this bottom panel, you can see that recently that's been around 20%. And that's even higher than the growth rate we saw just before the dot-com bubble burst in 2007. Now, what really drives house prices is the average level of earnings. And if we look at average hourly earnings in the United States, that's the blue line you can see beneath me here, for a long time it outstripped the growth of house prices, which you can see in red. So compared to wages, houses were becoming cheaper during this period. But recently that's reversed, so you can see that house prices are shooting up, whereas wages aren't. So Grantham makes the point that house prices are higher compared to your income than they've ever been. So if I divide the average house price by the average earnings in the United States, I also find that that's at a very high level. From the data I've got, it looks a little bit cheaper than it was in 2006, but it's still high nonetheless relative to income. But Grantham's not as worried about the housing bubble as he is about the equity bubble. And that's because of very low mortgage rates. And that's the blue line you can see beneath me. Compared to historic levels, 
it remains extremely low. And remember, in the United States, you can lock in a fixed rate for a 30-year period. And that's the number you can see here. Or as Grantham puts it, the mortgage is the lowest price it's ever been. So the mortgage is more underpriced than your house is overpriced, as he puts it. So if you are willing to keep your house for 30 years and not move, maybe you'll choose to rent it out. He thinks it's highly likely that you'll do okay. The third bubble is bonds. And just as with the mortgage rate, these are also at historic lows, even though recently they've been increasing sharply. So he says that shows that US bond markets are very expensive. And that's true not just in the US, but across much of the developed world. Now, as a result of that, GMO is actually suggesting that you don't take too much duration risk. In other words, you don't buy bonds which have got a long time left to run. So that means you use short duration funds or cash to hedge your equity position, or alternatively, other things which act as a hedge when equity markets tank. The half bubble is in commodities. Now here, Grantham isn't so worried about the markets themselves. And that's because most retail investors, such as you and I, don't get exposure to commodities via the futures market. Instead, what he worries about is what he calls the income effect. If the price of oil goes to 120, which he thinks is feasible, and the price of food and metals keeps going up, it simply squeezes your income. The consequence of that is that there's less disposable income for households. So for example, at the end of 2021, the Bureau of Labor Statistics put out a blog where it looked at some of these price rises. Now, the all items rate, which is now actually higher, was 7% of the time. But if you look at some components like energy, in particular gasoline, it was up 50% year on year. And the price of meats, poultry, fish and eggs was up over 12% over a year. So for the average American, the terrible combination of factors would be an increase in the cost of living at the same time that your house price falls and at the same time as your equity portfolio drops. So there could be a big triple whammy as costs increase and your wealth decreases. Valuation is something we discuss in the Patreon community all the time, and it's a great place to learn with like-minded people. If you want to join our friendly community and get access to all kinds of goodies like members-only videos and also our Slack channel, then just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me to learn more. Finally, what does all this mean for your portfolio? Well, according to Grantham, in the US equity market, you'll get no returns at all over the next decade. To see why that's the case, let's look at a couple of graphs here, which are actually created by Vanguard. Now, the band you can see with the dashed lines here shows you where expected returns would have been based on fundamentals calculated by Vanguard. Now, for a long period of time, they just kept up at the very higher end of expectations. But then since around 2017 or 2018, they've gone far above that expected return. Why would that be? Well, it was driven largely by euphoria. And if the euphoria fades, then what we'd expect is that equity markets would normalize and have poor returns as a result. Whereas if we look at non-US equity markets, so that's international equities, you can see pretty much the opposite, which is for a long period of time, they're actually lagging expectations and only recently have they gone into the lower bounds of the expected returns. And that suggests that there's much more upside for these non-US equities. So if Vanguard and Grantham are correct, then it suggests that you probably do well moving away from US equity over the next decade. Which equity markets would you use? Well, Grantham, of course, uses a fundamental metric, which is valuation. So in the graph that you can see beneath me here, what I've shown is the CAPE measure based on valuations at the beginning of 2022. And these percentages are the percentage of time that each market has been cheaper than it was at the beginning of this year. So for example, the US was cheaper 91% of the time. Whereas at the cheap end, you can see Japan's only been cheaper 15% of the time. And the UK's roughly in the middle. It's been cheaper about 62% of the time. Or as Grantham puts it, non-US equities are oddly semi-reasonable. They're overpriced, but they're not too bad. And one or two of them, like Japan and the UK, which we just saw, are really not materially overpriced. And he says that's unusual given how overpriced 
the United States is right now. As well as having a country tilt, Grantham also suggests that you have a factor tilt. So instead of buying growth stocks, which have done really well over the last decade, you tilt towards value stocks. These are the underpriced stocks, which have a low valuation. If we look at the forward price to earnings ratio for growth versus value in the United States, blue is the forward price to earnings ratio for growth, and red is the forward price to earnings ratio for value. Now, by definition, value is cheaper than growth always. But look at the difference between the two here. Notice how in 2000, there was a massive dispersion between the PE for value and the PE for growth. People were paying far too much for growth at that time. And if we look at the valuations now, again, people are paying too much for growth. So people have been saying for a long time now that value is going to be growth, but maybe this is it. At least Grantham certainly thinks so. And if we look at regional tilts, currently he likes emerging markets, despite the fact that China is a big part of emerging markets and there are question marks around the Chinese equity market right now. But certainly if we look at valuation, you can see that emerging markets are currently on a forward price to earnings multiple of around 12 times, which is far less than it is for the United States, which is at around 20.7. In fact, the combination that Grantham likes best is looking at value in EM, which he says is very reasonable right now. So there it is. That's Grantham's view about why we're in a super bubble right now. I think personally, I'd be a little bit less bearish than he is because I think you have to look at more valuation measures. If we do look at ones which are adjusted for yields, in other words, the level of bond yields, then it doesn't look quite as expensive. For example, Schiller's produced the excess Cape yield, which shows that currently we're not very expensive, but also not very cheap. So I think that actually the outlook is a bit more rosy than he suggests, but many of his points about the superposition of bubbles and the US housing market becoming expensive very quickly are very valid. And if those do pop at the same time, that could be a big problem. So remember our offer with Patreon. You can join our community and you can learn more about that in the link in the description and beside me. And as always, thank you for listening.